Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Hey, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. This is the first podcast of 2020. It is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Uh, And The new decade. Well, we haven't seen each other for uh, you know, maybe well, two weeks. I saw weeks. you like, I know. like five days ago. How was everybody's, amazing. how was everyone's holidays? It was great. Yeah? We're, yeah. We're in prime Christmas years now. Right, right, like right. Like seven. Yeah. She's right. about to turn seven. Santa Claus is uh, the business. <laughs> like, all the things were good. Lots That's of awesome. Candy. Yeah, we, like we did, we did a thing this year because like the, that lost week between Christmas and New Year's. Mm-hmm. The longest Sunday of the year. Yeah. I yeah. was just like, I was just like. Yeah, you know what? Let's have apple pie for breakfast. Yeah, she's like, "Can we have ice cream, Dad?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, we can have ice cream." <laughs> yeah, no rules. So, no rules. Everything was off. It's, it's a completely little, the longest Sunday. That's perfect. What is that? What is that terrible movie where all the kids murder each other? Uh, Lord Battle of the Royale. Flies. Battle Royale. That's it. It's the, the holiday battle royale of the food. Wow. Terrible movie. <laughs> wow. I got the frying pan. I love that yeah. movie. I got the spoon. <laughs> yeah, that one's a classic. Um, we had nine people in the house. That's nice. a lot of people. It was fantastic. I mean, it was crazy. Like staying and, there, not just for an evening. No, no. We had nine people staying in the yeah. house. Yeah. Did every you every horizontal <laughs> surface had a human oh, on it. <laughs> did, you, did you put lights on the house? Make everybody come out? Did you go I a little crazy? Hand, I brought uh, I brought uh, sleeping bags from storage. Mm, okay. Mm. Yeah. It was a wow. thing. It was it was great. Do you guys um, go all out with the lights? Hmm. Do you go out all out with lights? No. I do lights. No, I actually have a. Uh, we're in the fifth year of our fake tree. Yep. Yeah, yep. We're in year um, three. It's a, it's a, lights are integrated yeah. into yeah. the stock, although. One string went out this year. Oh, uh, that's. I had to do some soldering on ours. Really? I think I have to bring it here and literally workshop through each of the strands because yeah. I couldn't figure it out on the fly. Highly integrated is highly integrated. Our, ours does this thing. It took us a long time to find the. I, I, I grew up on a Christmas tree farm, so it felt really naughty for me to <laughs> no. get a fake tree. No. Blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, it means I never have to go to another tree lot again, which is fine. And ours does this thing. It has a. It has a. Um, uh, like a stiletto connector. Yeah. So when you socket it down, there's not even any wires to plug in. It's yeah, just no, me too. Jamming Same thing. And then the whole top half just lights up. It's the business, man. Yeah. It's amazing. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, so we're in the fifth year of that, and we actually, uh, my Christmas tree sat next to Totoro this year. Aww. So we had a neighbor um, buttonhole my wife out in front of the house last week and said, what's the thing in your window that's not a tree? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're in for such a treat. What yeah. a wonderful, what a wonderful, wonderful thing to find out about. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. There's a neighborhood south of San Francisco. I want to say it's like Chestnut Avenue in yeah. South San Francisco where like they go all out. It's one of those like, we don't have the kind of suburbs, the Christmas vacation <sighs> suburbs, mm. right? Or Not like, necessarily, but there and there are uh, Fair Oaks, a yeah. little street here between mm-hmm. Mission and Noe Valley does it. They close down and mm-hmm. have great uh, Christmas and Halloween. Right, right. Schrader uh, mm. over in uh, Coal Valley mm. closes down for at least Halloween. I don't know about Christmas. Think, uh, there's a guy in Noe that does... Um, that basically just sticks a bazillion stuffed animals and lights and like roller coasters oh, and wow. it's really cool. It's, it's, it's like very cool. If you're 10, it's, um, you look at it and you're like, oh man, like, where do they store that stuff? I ha- he, he said he has multiple storage units. There was a story you in the Chronicle him. about him a few you years ago. That's how we found out about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was, it was, it just looked like a nightmare to set up and take down. I was just looking, I was like, this is. This is like a solid 10 days of work, it looks like. Don't Crazy. take it down. Um, You've got to have the RGB LED so you can change from red and green and white to something that can last all year that's, round, that's right? That's the way. Did you saw the, do you know that they make addressable Christmas tree lights now? I do. Uh, Matt Howie was tweeting yeah, that's about Matt Howie and about Wave were tweeting about them. Twinkle, I think is what so they're called. So apparently you put this string on your tree and then you turn it on and you're controlling it via Bluetooth while pointing your phone at it so your phone can figure out where each light that's, is. Well, so And then animate shit across the front of your trees. We talked about it on TechPod a couple of weeks ago. They, yeah, they, they, you hold the phone up and it addresses each one individually. Right. And you do it, I think, from multiple sides. So Does it gets it a 3D really space. Quickly? It was, it seemed like, like the video made it look very fast. I did not spend $300 on the Christmas lights to find out. <laughs> um, not that difficult of a problem. It, it shouldn't it, be that difficult of a problem. all you do is either no. blinking at a certain speed or, or just... Yeah, they know what the arrangement yeah. is. Yeah. Well, the the hard part is figuring out where the light is in three D space, not right. figuring out which light That's is why which. You have multiple sides. Yeah. yeah. That's nifty. Um, 
I'm I'm th- those are cur- I'm curious about those. Well, I'm the, light curious. I was going to say there's a guy in the well they've gotten they've they've reduced in price dramatically each year they've been out so far. So like next year or the year after they'll be affordable for for more people. Well, then the question is, can you use them for cosplay? Oh, I think absolutely. Right. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um yeah. There, there's a guy in the back of the valley where I live in Pacifica that does like you pull up and there's a ra- sign in the front that says tune your radio to like 6:90 a.m. and then every 15 minutes he does like a 15 minute light show where it's all animated oh. and choreographed and the whole thing it is it is garish and amazing. Wait, so he's broadcasting He's broadcasting locally. on a low wattage yeah. uh, AM station. As you're driving by. Okay. Well, you pull out in front and you put, turn on your car radio and get out of the car. I want to move on from this. Yeah, sorry. Because there's a lot <laughs> of, I, I saw a lot of things sorry, over yeah, yeah. the holidays. Yeah, you, you, had, you had an adventure. Yeah. What happened to you? Anything I, oh, exciting? Yeah. My land, on uh, Saturday, December 28th, I woke up <clears throat> to put my mom on the plane to go visit my sister in Los Angeles. Okay. And as I walked out of the front of the house to put her in the car, I noticed my Land Cruiser was not parked out on the street where I had left it. Oh, no. And I thought, ah, my Land Cruiser's gone. And then I thought, well, there's nothing that I can do now that I can't do after I put my mom in the car and go get some coffee. So I put my mom in the car and I went and got some coffee. Then I came back. Walked over to Mission Station, filed a police report, came home. So you waited 30 minutes. I waited so. about, about 30 minutes, right. yeah. But you're not, are you freaking out on the inside? I'm not, I'm not freaking out. Here's the thing. Or you're just like... It's just an object. Yeah. Nobody's health is in danger. Uh, you know, I have old dogs and my kids are out of the house. It takes a lot to rattle me these days. And I saw the Land Cruiser was missing and I thought, ah, oh, that sucks. But it's just an object and it's nobody's health and frankly... It's just a thing to deal with. Plus, honestly, I'm kind of curious what tested Land Cruiser people think, but there can't be very many right-hand drive 1982 diesel Land Cruisers in the United States. Uh, That has to be a fairly rare item. I don't know whether that means there's 10 or 50 here. Or like 200. Or 200. But I came home from the police station and I was typing up a tweet. That was going to announce to Land Cruiser owners the countrywide, hey, here's my engine number, my VIN number, this Land Cruiser is stolen, keep an eye out for it. And I felt fairly confident I would see my Cruiser again. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. this isn't a huge community. These are, these are fairly rare pieces. And as I was typing this up, I had just gotten to the end of the first tweet and I was adding to the second tweet to the tweet thread Building when my storm. doorbell rang yeah. and it was Officer Hernandez from the southern part of San Francisco telling me that they had found my Land Cruiser. Wow. wow. <laughs> and it was weirdly not more than about a mile from where I used to live in Sunnyside in San Francisco um, off of a little... Okay, San Francisco... Uh, has, I think, three to five dirt roads left in the city. Wow, really? Yeah. I yeah. didn't know this. There are some little, little... Are park you, adjacent? What's that? Park adjacent? Yeah, some of them. Yeah. Uh, some of them are up in... There's one up in Bernal. Okay. Right? Uh, and there's... Uh, wow. Yeah. So uh, there's another over near the Presidio. Um, and this one is off of Diamond Street, up above Glen Park, the bottom of Glen Park, where the grocery store is, oh. um, off a little lane called Poppy Lane. And Poppy Lane is paved for about its first 200 feet, and then it's about a half mile long and ends up in one of those no man's land hills that's behind all the buildings. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and they had driven my cruiser up there and gotten it stuck at about a 30 degree angle in the mud. It, was, it had rained a lot. And uh, yeah. to their credit, they had ground the the wheels deep, deep, deep. The thing was resting on its drive system, oh on the drivetrain. So like, why, I mean, and we'll get to what happened after, but <laughs> why was this the route and why did it end up there? That's such a fascinating question. I have no idea. Right? So, uh, like, look, what, what does this go, if it's a dead in, end, like... In their minds, they wouldn't have been stuck. They were, their goal yeah. wasn't to get it stuck. So where were they taking it Rowdy to? Rowdy Teen's joyriding is what it sounds like. Here's my theory. Yeah. Poppy Lane has a turnout about uh, three quarters of the way up it. And you could see the tire tracks where he had attempted a bunch of K turning. Okay. I think that when he, when he, so I, I can't see his face on my ring camera because ring cameras suck, but I could see him hotwire the car and drive away so I could hear that he could drive a stick. 
I know it's a he. Uh, I can see his body shape. Uh, and he left the house at 4 a.m., uh, 10 minutes before 4 a.m. Wow. And the neighbors didn't hear him grinding the car into the mud until about six, after six. Hmm. So there's a couple of hours where he's driving around the city. Yeah. Um, I know, uh, 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 like, we know where it ended up. The que my question was actually, did he choose any other dirt roads to go up? Because this doesn't feel, this didn't feel like someone who stole this car to sell it. Yeah, if they had stolen it to sell it, they would have driven it straight to the chop shop and you'd never right. seen it again. They, they, yeah. they, this was kind of feels like a one-off joy ride. And then it's hilarious because I, I'm almost immediately, I mean, what happened afterwards was that the cops and I called a pickup. The tow truck couldn't make it up the road, so we called a second pickup. <laughs> that pickup came and got stuck trying to pull my car out. Oh, so then boy. we had to call a third pickup truck to get the second pickup truck out of there. And then once we got the second pickup truck out, the third one was able to winch mine to safety. Oh, I didn't know it took three. I saw the two on Twitter. Well, the, so there was a first one I never even okay. tweeted about that couldn't even make it up the drive. I mean, um, that, that looked like a tractor, like hooking a chain to the axle well, and pulling and, out with the tractor I mean, situation. Everything about this area made it difficult. There were tree stumps, but none of them were closer than 150 feet away. Yeah. They were all off angle. Um, it was leaning towards a neighbor's fence. And by the way, the neighbors that I dealt with, Hamadi, uh, Kathy, uh, Byron and Lynette, all the neighbors were awesome. Like, like they were, like, they just, they all came out. Look, it's the longest Sunday. They got a, <laughs> they got a great story to tell. Um, some no local damage kids done. came out, like saw me live tweeting, figured out where I was and came out to say hi and oh, shake my awesome. hand. Um, so look, at the moment I knew I was getting it back, I kind of really chilled out and was like, oh, I guess I'm here for the day. You yeah. seemed like you were having fun. I was. From the tweets. I yeah. was. And, and live tweeting, it was very enjoyable. Uh, you know, I love it when adventures happen to people I like on Twitter and following how yeah. those adventures go. And so that was no it's, exception. So that was my post-Christmas adventure. It's also always much more fun to watch someone having a bad time pulling something out of the mud than to be the person having a bad time pulling something out of the mud. Like it's, it's not, it's not fun to watch them suffer, but like it's definitely better to be in the witness position than the people cursing position. I, I was ready to help. I was, yeah. and I actually did help with some key pieces of advice because I have a lot of experience pulling heavy things out of weird places. Yeah. Uh, and these guys were actually, <laughs> that's the title of your second book, pulling <laughs> heavy things out of weird places. I will tell you, like they were really nervous about pulling it because it was leaning towards someone fence. Yeah. Mm. And they were like, oh, if we pull it, it could tip over. And I said, actually, decidedly not. It's in a hole that's making it face 30 degrees, but the ground is only at like 18 degrees. So the moment you pull it back, it's going to go level up. And they were like, well, if you're willing to take responsibility. And I'm like, well, yeah, sure. Go do it. Yeah. And we did it and it was fine. It worked yeah, you, perfectly. You come back out and build a fence the next day if it doesn't work out. Well, they did, of, they uh, did have to uh, repair the fences. Of moving a couch down the stairs, right? Everyone has their opinion on the best way to do it. And oh, no you know way. that it's an unsolvable problem still. What do you, what do you mean unsolvable? Well, so Un math mathematically, if you want to reduce the couch problem, which is an irregular object moving around a corner in a confined space. Um, there is still not yet, and I think Matt Parker from Number Files is visiting San Francisco again soon, so I'll have to double check with him, but I think there is still not yet a definitive proof, um, for N shape to get around X corner, Y corner to, that wow, yes, really? it's possible or not possible. It is a way thornier problem than you think it is. The couch, huh. the, the couch down the hall, couch up the stairs. Yeah, up the, up the 90 degree yeah. turn. Apparently, it's a much trickier problem than than we think it is. Did you, did you ever read Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency? Yeah, a million years ago. Yeah, it's, it's got the best solve for the couch problem ever. What was that? Well, the magic door opens in the midway through the stairs <laughs> as they're bringing the couch up and then right. gets it irrevocably stuck in, in, the, couch, in the stairs. Um, hey, I saw a couple of pieces of uh, entertainment this Ooh, over, oh yes. over the holidays. I went and saw Hamilton again. Hey, so me too. I. You did? <laughs> yes, last Thursday. And you did too. I just saw it for the first time. Amazing. On Sunday. Jeremy, <laughs> so we all saw the same company. It was amazing. We did. So really this good. is the company to be sure. We haven't talked about this on the podcast. We have not. Okay. So this is the company that it turns out was the company assembled for the Puerto Rican yes. uh, fundraising mm -hmm. shows. Where that, Lin Manuel came back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and did the one one more performance. And for the one last lead time? and the lead that we saw. Yes. was his understudy That's right. in Puerto Rico, doing the oh. rehearsals with the main cast so that Lynn could helicopter in 
three days before and take over his role. Wow. Yeah, this and is... that guy, whose name escapes me right now, and I'm really sorry about that, he was fin- basically, it was a phenomenal cast. I thought it was the super, super tight. Because I saw the previous San Francisco show, which was great, but I felt that the Puerto Rican cast was way tighter with each we're, other. We are Broadway nerds for this show. We are we super Broadway nerds for, for example, this For example, the first time it came through San Francisco, it was the uh, then the Chicago Hamilton, mm-hmm. who then went on tour for, for us. And then this technically is a tour. They call it the Ann Peggy Tour. And it started last February in San Francisco, and they kept on extending it. So it's now going through end of May. But the company does swap out. Mm-hmm. Some of the performers. Yes, and and I think the show that I saw was one of the last with the with the the brunt of that cast on yes. Sunday, and then they split up and are going different ways. Uh, terrific um, cast. It was un, it was it was one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen live on Sunday. So you got to see it for your first time, Very first and time. you're familiar with the libretto. I I have listened to the original cast recording. I don't know. Spotify would probably tell you at least hundreds, maybe thousands okay, of times. Okay, so that to me, that's the best way to see it. It was like the thing. It it the, it was beautiful because I was able to pay attention to what was happening on stage, and and the staging and the sets and the costumes, and not have to worry about following the plot because I I thought I knew the plot and I knew the the high points, but there was definitely stuff that I missed. Only yeah. having seen the cast recording. Well, and there's one part of the libretto that's not in the cast recording, which is the yes, death yeah, of the, John Lawrence, yeah. which is super sad. Yeah, I, the letter that's that she reads him. Well, and there's there's also a part, I think at the very end, uh, there's a spoken spoken word part at the very end um, when Hamilton is talking when he's I think it's I think it's maybe his dual letter. I don't think is in the cast recording either. No, I'm not there. It, it is. is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but seeing, like, I had listened to the libretto thousands of times before I saw it on Broadway, and I had worked out most of the blocking in my head. I was sure that when Washington said, pick up a pen, start writing, that he actually did this, and sure enough, Pouring he did. Pouring drinks when he's have one less drink. Uh, yeah, all that stuff. But nothing prepared me for how beautiful Hurricane is as a piece of choreography with the two circles moving in opposition to each other and the dancers. So this is my third time seeing it on stage. We started paying attention to only the dancers. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's, the there's ensemble. so much. Yeah. Well, and, and King George makes appearances oh. up in the eaves to mock yes! at, at key moments yes! throughout. Um, the, I wasn't prepared for how dynamic having the, the turntables would make the performance and have them able to do walk and talks and things like that and how they shift from two perspectives of the story as they go. It's a remarkable piece of choreography on its whole. And also, um, when you get into the libretto, I find the King George songs tend to be ones you skip over first because oh, all, th- it, all three times he sings, it's effectively the same song. It's the song. same song, yeah. But when you see it on stage, what King George does with those songs is thrilling and hilarious and disturbing like, and amazing you don't know if you're supposed to laugh but you laugh yeah it's an uh, it's an uncomfortable it's an uncomfortable titter from the audience i got to um we got to go backstage <sighs> when we saw it um so i got to hold king george's crown Ooh. which apparently all the crowns of all the different shows are all a little bit different oh, oh. how all, is that strapped oh. in because um, like, it looks very heavy it is well so the earliest crowns were like five pounds yeah. these are now lightweight at Two and a half. Oh, great. That's okay. still pretty heavy. It's still looks, pretty. No, it it's still pretty heavy. heavy. Um, and it's got a microphone built into it. Wonderful. Um, I, I, the candle situation, I wasn't aware of. We talked about this a little bit before, before yeah, the yeah, show. Yeah. But, but the fact, most of those candles are electric candles that they've gutted the electronics on. Except when she burns the letter. Except for when she burns the letter. Fire. That yeah. one obviously is real. But, but, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, the, the, contra- the candles are all remote controllable from the lighting booth. Dude, wow. electronic candles. I mean, I know we just did my one yeah. day build with the yeah. flame bulb, but electronic candles is something we haven't covered and they're amazing. There's, there's so much cool work happening in everything from like those tea lights that Ikea sells for like 75 cents each yeah. on up to, to the, yeah, it's bonkers. So, so this it's is still this, a flame. What's that? It's still a flame or it's not a flame? It, it no, it's looks, not a flame. It lo- no, it's not a flame, but oh. so th- I, I have some of these, they're big, like three inch diameter candles. They're actually coated in real wax. So they yeah. smell like candles. And the f- quote flame is a flame shaped piece of plastic mm-hmm. with an LED pointed at it. And it's on a little, little, little electromagnetic mover mm-hmm. that just makes it kind of do this so that as you look over to it, Incredibly it's, it convincing. feels yeah. super convincing. Yeah. Um, 
and this is this is worth a larger conversation later on. But like yeah. for my entire life, the joke has been that cheap crap comes from China. And frankly, you know, the fact that that flame bulb runs for a week, like a super efficient circuit on something that doesn't have to be because it's running off of house power. Like the joke about Chineseium products is is becoming more and more moot as things get better. And the iterations of fake candles have been fantastic. We have hundreds of them in the house and we use them for all sorts of parties. Yeah. I need the remote control ones, it turns out, because... You know, those little tiny switches, it's just your fingers get really tired. Turn them all on and off. <laughs> Lazy bastard. Um, um, I also saw Uncut Gems. Oh, oh. Adam Sandler's Oscar. Adam, the latest one from the Sandlerverse. So, it's not the Sandlerverse. It is, this is his, if he doesn't get an Oscar nomination for this, there's no justice. Because it's really? an unbelievable lifetime performance, huh. what he does in this film. And it's super, basically, I love the movie. You should go see it. I never want to sit through it again. It's like Punch Truck Love. It's super stressful. Yeah. It's super stressful all the way through. It is a almost a fever dream. The movie takes place over like three days uh, as you're watching a, a New York Diamond Merchant's life kind of falling apart. Um, there's tons of non-actors in the movie hmm. who you don't realize are non-actors. Hmm. Several of the main characters have never been on camera before. Wow. Eric Bogosian plays the villain. He's terrifying. Um, and the premise is that he works in the, like New York Diamond trade. New York Diamond District, 47th conned, Street. Yep. Con some people. Well, he's 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 over leveraged. Okay, it's not a con until you don't pay ever. Right, right. right. So he's right. leveraging this to pay for that, to pay for this. He owes all this money. It, and is it stressful because of the situations he's put in, or because of the way he exudes anxiety or deals with it? All of the above. Okay. Um, also, basketball player Kevin Garnett. Yeah. Has a significant cameo as one of the main yeah. characters and plot drivers. And he's amazing. Wow. He's, I mean, KG. plus apparently a lot of these scenes were workshopped and improvised as well as being scripted. So they had ins and outs, but like for apparently for KG, for some of those scenes. Uh, and again, I'm, I, I haven't read deeply into this, so I could be wrong. This is how it was reported to me. Uh they told them what the goal was of the scene and they workshopped a bunch of different ways through it. Kevin Garnett is incredible. So wow. it's super amazing film. The Safety brothers directed wow. it. Um, really worth seeing. Uh, I watched Jojo Rabbit. I have not That's yet seen fantastic. it, but I got a screener. Uh, it is, so I want to see it soon. It is. You, you should sit down and watch that. It is, it is a lovely, very funny, incredible. Like I, I loved it. I'm probably fine. I'm never watching it again. Yeah, there are moments <laughs> oh, really? That, yeah. yeah. It, and, it's probably Taika Waititi's most serious film, even though... I mean, I don't think that's hard to say. Well, y yes, it's, because of the subject matter. Well, I, but also because of his other films are Hunt for the Wilder People and uh, what we do Boy, in the Dodgers. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. and I think he'd been working on this for a long time, even before he made um, uh, What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, it's an adaptation. It's about you know a boy in Nazi Germany in, in the waning years of uh, World War II uh, and his imaginary friend is Hitler. Played, <laughs> played by played Taika Waititi. So yes. we had this whole thing as, uh, like, uh, <laughs> like played unbelievably my, by Taika Waititi. No, I know. And this is the thing I was like, my, we were going to go see it. And my wife was like, I don't know that I can take a slapstick comedy about Nazis. It's not a slapstick. And, and, yeah. But that's, that's definitely what the trailer implies. <laughs> and I said, baby, I totally get you. I can't see how it could possibly work. I'm kind of curious to see how you thread that needle. And we ended up getting derailed by a, 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 a sick dog at that point because it was over the holidays and we haven't gotten to see it. But now I got a screener. I'm going to watch it. The supporting cast. So Sam Rockwell's in there. Uh, oh. He's in Great. Uh, Scott Johansson, Johansson is going to get a nomination for, really? I think, her role. She plays so. his mother. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. And then he, there's a new actor uh, who plays his best friend, who is like the plucky comic relief, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he's going to be a star. Amazing. He's, he's, he's very good. Yeah. He, um, I think they're casting him as the new Home Alone kid. I was oh. just thinking we needed a new oh, Home Alone. Oh, that kid. Yeah. Have we, um, have, so moving slightly on, mm -hmm. Yeah. have we talked about... The Watchmen finale? We did. We did. We did. We did. We did. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, Good. Let's talk about, I'm yeah. going to stick with movies, because I saw two yep. movies. Right. Yep. Uh, Something's whacking here. I saw Little Women. Ooh. Dude. Let's talk about Little Had Women. Have you seen Little Women, uh, Little Women before? Is I've this your seen, first Little Women? No, I've seen Little Women before. Okay. Yeah. Not, not like I saw this. the medium-sized woman, but not the Little Woman. This is Greta Gerwig's um, that was his joke, second not mine. movie. <laughs> to be clear, I don't want anything I to do with that. I like how he kind of got pissed off at you for that joke. I know. He looked at me like it was my fault. 
and uh, what was her first movie? Lady Bird. Okay. So it's still with uh, and she Social wrote Francis Ha. She did. Oh, so, yes. Uh, Noah Baumbach's partner now, um, and uh, longtime collaborator with Noah Baumbach. Um, director of Marriage Story and mm-hmm. many other amazing films. I've been a fan of his since his first movie, Kicking and Screaming. Mm-hmm. Not the Will Ferrell movie. The, uh, yeah, not the one about uh, soccer. Uh, the, yeah, Eichner, uh, Chris, I- Chris Eichmann film. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, it's it's. I guess it's tough for dudes to talk about Little Women. No, it's it not. It, it's a fantastic movie. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, mean, I cried at it. Th- Everyone's throughout. amazing in it. I think uh, at the end of the movie, you just kind of sit there and linger and want to be with the marches more. Like... Like it, the movie is so loving. It's, it's incredibly a, loving, even as it's complicated and characters genuinely suffer because of each other and still love each other. All of that is extant. The on love screen. between sisters, mother and daughters, friends, neighbors. So much of it feels that was the most warm. It was a perfect Christmas movie to watch because totally. it just exuded love in every scene. No, I, I even in their fights. Agreed. Agreed. Um, the performances are across the board incredible. Um, the actress that plays the woman that ends up um, marrying Laurie. Yeah. So the, the Amy, one from Midsommar. Yes. Uh, that's Florence Pugh. Florence Pugh is going to be a gigantic star. Yeah. She's, She's in Black so Widow good next. in this movie. She was in Midsummer and also uh, Fighting with My Family. Okay. Was she the lead in Midsummer? She was the lead in okay. Midsummer. Yeah, she was fabulous um, yeah. in that. The, yeah. the entire cast of Little Women is incredible, including Bob Odenkirk, who shows up. Yeah. Tracy Letts also. <laughs> Bob Odenkirk is always good. Oh, my God. Chris Cooper. Heartbreaking. Yes. Ah. Uh, so and and Timothy Chalamet, this this decade's it boy. Mm. <laughs> I mean, come on, really? I mean, he's definitely well. They were the that chemistry. Right, yeah. that the chemistry is with he's, with all. Yeah, it, it, it's he's surpassingly charismatic. Yeah. Uh, every bit deserved to be the it guy because he's incredible. And I watched uh, the King. Oh, okay. Uh, on his Netflix, Netflix yeah, show yeah. that's basically Henry V without the iambic pentameter. Okay, that sounds um, really great. worth seeing. Yeah. Actually, great. Uh, Joel Edgerton plays Falstaff. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, I'm, in, I'm into this. But <laughs> one thing that's interesting with Little Women, because it is an adaptation, yeah. is that it's the way she not only uh, does it non-linearly, mm-hmm. a lot of it in, in flashbacks, yeah. and, and pairing scenes together in ways that if you read the book chronologically, you don't n- oh, often see. Oh, I didn't think of it the structurally that way. Structurally, that's it's, I think, part of the magic of mm-hmm. this. But then also the way they talk and the way they dress, it all feels very modern. Yeah. Um, it's... The ensemble work of the sisters, uh, the scenes of them in every pairing that there could be. Mm-hmm. When they're just performing a play together. Yeah. Um, and the, the the ways in which they talk specifically to the transactional nature of marriage and romance that has to be considered by women and can be conveniently forgotten by men. Uh, and the ways in which that can cause harm wittingly and unwittingly. It's, it's a very, very amazing meditation. Uh, I, I really am looking forward to seeing it again. Hmm. And it's probably going to be one of those ones I go back to more than a few times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I got to go see it. Uh, the other one I saw, it's 1917. Oh, I can't wait. I saw them both on the same day. Jesus. Oh, that's a hell of a double I, feature. Is, it was exhausting. Which one did you see first? Little Women first. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> 1917. Um, I'm going to follow this up with uh, Am Clove I cor- So winner. 1917 is Sam Mendes. Sam yeah. Mendes. Who did uh, the last two Bond films, right? Yes. He did, uh, no, he did Casino Royale and... No, no. no, he did not do Casino Royale. He did Spectre and Skyfall. Oh, that's right. That's I'm sorry. Yes, 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 yes. And this is him reuniting with Roger Deakins, who also uh, DP'd Skyfall. And, 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 and a million... And of course, and Coen Brothers and... Am I correct it's supposed yeah. to be Runner. one continuous shot. And that is the conceit of what? this piece of filmmaking. It yeah. A one hour, 58 minute movie. It tells essentially the two hour <laughs> adventure of these two soldiers, British soldiers who have a mission to do behind the no man's land to start in the trenches, World War One, 1917, yeah. in no man's land on the British side. And they have to end up on another front line. Dude, Wonder Woman did that in like of, two minutes. Well, Geographically, yeah, there's a lot know, of versions of this yes, movie yes. that last 90 <laughs> seconds. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say it, it is. So from a, it, he won he won best director at the Golden Globes, mm-hmm. and the film won um, you know best film, best dramatic yeah, film. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think it's the my favorite film of the year, but if the award is for achievement in filmmaking, I think it is well deserved of that because. So, mm. I will say the conceit of it being a single shot is distracting at times. Oh. 
because if you know that going in, and, yeah. and I'm sure plenty of people go in not knowing it, right, and they don't right. even think about it. There's yeah. like, oh wow, why am I feeling exhausted? Well, you're just tense. Why, yeah. You're just tense. Why am I feeling this? Mm -hmm. And then maybe they realize, oh wow, this is a single shot, like like Birdman was. But if you go in knowing that, and you have worked in film or any type of production, you're looking for the cuts. Right, right, you're right. Looking yeah, for you're the looking time. for the fades. Yeah. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. there are many times where it's completely seamless. Right. But it's the technical cuts which are the amazing technology they have and like the way they move cameras from a steady cam to mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. uh, to a vehicle to then like in, in the ways that they can use pan a around person the, exactly the to or whatever, a wire. Yeah. Um, but the performances sometimes, it's tough to have a consistency in performance. They do cuts mid conversation. And so you're asking an actor to do a take, have a conversation with one other character walking through, you know, a forest and they're passing by a tree and the sentence continues. Right. But you can kind of tell the energy is slightly different Ooh. because they've it's a different take huh. or because they've they've you, you know, should be able to gloss over that with ADR and stuff like that, shouldn't you? You, you should, but you can the, even the, the speaking how, like the, I know how to direct energy, a film. I have right? no idea. Adam Savage, <laughs> I'm your director. It shows how tough that this this yeah, yeah. this attempt is. Uh, and they do there's a trick here and there like I, I would it's not a spoiler to say like not the whole thing doesn't happen in two hours. There is one cut in the middle that they achieve with a blackout. Yeah. Okay. Oh, as a, a bomb goes off. Or, I mean, something happens, <laughs> right? Like, like. So the thing for me watching Birdman is, I it, the tension because there was no cut. You wait. You wait for those cuts for the tension to to re, to release tension in the mm -hmm. film. And by the end of that movie, I was so just like my shoulders were clenched. Well, Birdman had the passing of time. They would do. He would pan to looking out a window, and yeah, you would see still, the sunset. Right. So and and you would have time lapses essentially. But Will is bringing up something. Uh, Walter Murch has a theory about editing, uh, and the way he edits, from what I understand, is he makes a cut and watches the scene with that cut. And then he erases the cut and chooses the cut again and watches the scene. And only when he's chosen the same exact cut point, mm. like two or three times, mm -hmm. that it's the natural place, that it's consistent, that's when he chooses that cut. And he has this theory that we blink in the same reason that dogs shake to kind of transition from one consciousness moment to the next. Yeah. And that cuts happen on the blink. That cuts happen at a rhythm that matches the way in which we blink to change subjects and to gear shift, as it were. And so it it follows that even if you're not noticing that it's a continuous shot, that at a certain point you're getting exhausted because mentally you're, there's no blinking going on. Well, it's it's like old Steve Martin comedy, or you know, where right, he just, the tense would, is just he just doesn't give anybody time and to and laugh held. and keeps hammering jokes yeah. at you until you're just like, ah. Oh. And yeah. some of that I think is done very intentionally. I mean, they had the screenwriter. I think Sam and his wrote it with. Uh, co-writer but they had to keep it moving forward like right, the whole movie right. has continued moving yeah. forward it's got and a momentum and, and the first i would say 10 minutes is them working through these walking through these trenches and having their conversations right and it's exhausting but there's also not a lot going on because mm. it's a different part of the front line okay. and so you have the soldiers kind of going about their lives mm -hmm. and it's like well i don't know if i want to watch you know, the two guys having a 15 minute conversation. I want to get to the action, but I think that's all intentional because by the time you get to the action, you want the quiet moments, just like in right, the war. Right, right, yeah. right. Like yeah. the war is is not nonstop fighting. Like people are just, some of just for days and weeks waiting in the foxhole for the next engagement. Right. And you're never prepared for it. And <laughs> so when suddenly they're being shot at, it's it's like oh, a sword punch. Sounds oh, that's like, really cool. Sounds like the inverse of the thin red line. Yeah. Right, where it's just a bunch of sitting around talking and then all of a sudden somebody gets shot out of nowhere and then they go back, they're like, oh, well. <laughs> um, uh, I, I also saw a film I had been waiting to see that I heard was really great. I saw Hustlers. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I saw the, that. Yeah. The stripper heist movie, yeah. as, as it's been. Heist Gangster movie. Gangster movie. What's that? Gangster. Yeah. yeah. I will tell you that the word that I got from the internet was stripper heist movie. Right, mm -hmm. it was very much like a Ocean's Five kind of mm. Steven Soderbergh style clever thriller. Was how the internet made me believe this film would be. Uh -huh. I totally disagree yeah, with that assessment not. of it. It is not that movie. What is it? It's more it's, than a casino, ish. But it's basically, I, it's enjoyable ish. Jennifer Lopez is amazing. I've been a fan of her since the beginning. She's a phenomenal actress um, and she does great in it. But this movie feels like it was directed by a couple of 15 year olds. It is 
28 minutes into the film before you see a woman wearing normal street clothes. So slightly less horny than cats. They spend at least 40 minutes doing storytelling that could have been done seriously in five or six minutes and gotten us into the meat of the oh. plot. The shift that really should be the middle Act two kind of turn doesn't happen until like almost the end of the movie. It's structurally bizarre. And I'm not saying it's not enjoyable and that the casting isn't great. Constance Wu is fantastic in it. But the dialogue is all over the place. Mm. And frankly, it's just the the, the amount of – there's literally a, a almost real-time 15-minute pole dancing teaching sequence between J-Lo and her protege. I think that's all. I, I don't think that's intent to be titillating as much as it's about control and the power they have. I, in, I'm sure, in, except that in every scene, they seem like parodies of what a 15-year-old thinks strippers' lives are like. Like, they all go shopping wearing low-cut cleavage dresses and, like, ha-ha-ha, laughing and pouring champagne on each other. It's, yeah. it, I'm curious whether that's a studio <laughs> note or the record note. Because it was directed by a woman. Like, Yeah. yeah. Uh, listen, I you know... I, I'm only saying my impression of it, yeah. it from from my point of view. Yeah. I just found it kind of shocking that I was 30 minutes into the movie before I'd gotten to someone wearing anything but lingerie. I haven't seen it yet. So. <laughs> but it'll be very soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll be uh, no, I'm doing this afternoon. Um, um, I saw Once Upon a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Finally. Ah, yeah. How did you like it? I I thought it was very cool. Mm -hmm. Much like Ad Astra. Like looking at Brad Pitt is very, it's very satisfying. It's very He's relaxing. a very attractive man. <laughs> um, I think we all can agree. Yeah, on that. Roof. You're just like, man, he, he looks, a, he looks a little bit older, but wow, it's, it's like he's Clooneying at a really high level. <laughs> he's um, so pretty. <laughs> so, but I, I don't like. It feels like a really odd story to do the Inglorious Bastards treatment on, and and like alt history, a thing that happened, like. I don't understand why that story had to be. I knew I, I I love that Tarantino went and made a movie set in the seventies that he shot like a movie made in the seventies. I totally agree with and that. And like I love the way it was shot. I love the cinematography. I don't think it had to. There was no reason it had to have anything to do with the Sharon Tate. I I murders. found it strange that the idea of the brutality of the Manson murders, which was subverted for the brutality of the curbing of the Manson murders, was all in the vein of a networking opportunity for our main character. That made yeah. like that made when the credits rolled, I was a little pissed off. Well, about I mean, it. I, I look, I can see that as a kind of when you put it that way, it feels like commentary on Hollywood vapidness, certainly. But but like. It's a commentary on Hollywood vapidness in the '70s, not Hollywood vapid, vap, vapidity. What vapidity? Vapidity, yeah, yeah. vapidity in in the 21st century. I, I, I just like it was really off putting to take something that was like to contrast with Inglorious Bastards at the end, where you know um, she murders Hitler mm -hmm. and and all the leading yep. generals. That's that's kind of a, a fantasy wish fulfillment thing that I think a lot of people would be like, man, it would have been fucking awesome if somebody went through and murdered right, Hitler yeah. in like 1938. Yeah. Um, it's not like people were clambering for that. Yeah, it's not <laughs> for the 70s. Yeah. 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 I also, I have very, very, I have a weird taste in my mouth about him making Bruce Lee into a fool. I, And this is a really specific thing. It just... It it made me feel strange. I got what he was like. I've read interviews with Tarantino about how he was attempting to establish Cliff Booth's character. And by the way, Cliff Booth, one of the greatest names that's ever been come up yeah. with. Um, but it still that scene made me feel really sad. He seemed it like it was especially sad to take somebody who was, was very much in the kind of John Wayne shitty older area era of Hollywood misogynist racist generally you know like great actor not a great guy yeah and and to make him not that not that brad pitt's character in this movie was that guy but that's the read i got on this at the beginning was that um that uh uh the the lead leonardo uh, dicaprio played yeah. by leonardo dicaprio was very much in the john wayne yeah. john wayne school of western acting right and and to have him come in or his proxy come in and and make Bruce Lee seem like a chump was yeah. profoundly uncool. Totally. Uh, uh, Zoe Bell. 
fantastic. Zoe Bell, though. amazing. Wonderful. Totally amazing. And I loved seeing Luke Perry show up oh. in his last movie role. And I don't know if you read this, but Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio have done interviews where they talked extensively in multiple interviews about how over the moon they were to meet their icon of cool, <laughs> Luke Perry. Oh, because they were effectively kids when he oh, was right. coming up. Right, he's older than them, and they were like, he was it in the early '90s, man. Yeah. Right, because what Thelma Louise was like, like 1988 or something. Thelma Louise is 86? later than that. 90, oh yeah, 91 or 92. Yeah, this was when I was in high school. Right, so Luke Perry's right there in oh, yeah. that. Right, he was super cool then. So I love that idea, and apparently they like loved having him on set. They loved watching him go, and he was great. He had a great time, and I'm sad to lose Luke Perry, uh, but I thought that was a really nice uh, coda. Yeah. As it were. One uh, takeaway I had was I want to see him. I know he has limited number of films he wants to direct. Uh, he says left. he wants to do 10 and that's it. This and is the ninth. This is the, yeah, yeah. We'll see. So the next one is a He'll gr gritty Star, Star um, Trek. But I want to see him do a horror film. I mean, that scene where Brad Pitt Cliff Booth goes to the ranch and looks for and goes you know, super yeah, creepy yeah super yeah. Creepy. uh was that dakota fanning or l fanning uh, dakota fanning dakota fanning playing yeah. squeaky from was yeah. terrifying yeah. bruce dern amazing <sighs> I, I didn't recognize Bruce Stern, which is like, <laughs> I don't know how you don't recognize Bruce Stern, but yeah, it was really good. Um, yeah, look, I loved <laughs> so much about that movie and the overall end product made me feel a little cold and and just not awesome. I didn't uh, want to hang out with those characters anymore. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fall in love with any, frankly, that's one of the things that's great about Tarantino is even his evil characters can be so lovable and smart and amazing uh, and in this film, I didn't like anybody. Hmm. <laughs> I, like there, that that was I, I just didn't connect with any specific Sharon Tate, character. Margot Robbie too. Yeah, and I thought film. Margot Robbie did great with a very minor role, but I loved what she did with it. Yeah. I also loved the choice of not changing the actual footage of Sharon Tate in the theater. When she's watching. Herself. I thought that was a great artistic choice. Oh, she's choice. watching the performance. From she's watching the, the, the performance Sharon of actual performance. Sharon yeah. Tate. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, like this to me seemed like a thing that he wanted to make because he wanted to make a movie set in that specific, like he hasn't made seventies movies before. Sure. So uh, that's totally yeah. his prerogative. I, yeah. I, I want him to make all the movies he wants to make. Yeah. I, you know, please keep making movies. <laughs> I got two recommendations uh, yeah. related to Bruce Lee. One is there's a documentary on Netflix made in Australia about martial arts films and influence on American and global culture, starting with the 60s uh -huh. uh, it's called iron fist and kung fu kicks and it goes into how martial arts films made in hong kong specifically were imported in the style of filmmaking yeah from the uh the golden harvest pictures and the uh, shaw brothers pictures mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how all of that stuff was you know the business behind how u.s film uh studios bought those up re-edited them redubbed them and how then they went back to china and 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 oh, like, wow. That, that nature. Uh, Iron Fist and Kung Fu Kicks um, interview uh, a lot of great people. And it also talks about Bruce Lee's legacy and a lot of the context that we don't really understand, like how young he died and how his legend grew after his his death. Right, right, right. Um, and then related to that. Yeah, the number of films he made before he died is shockingly small. Yes. Like a, yeah. under a dozen, right? It's... And then they took, they found like old stuff he did when he was like doing opera stuff and, and after he died and like redubbed it and made movies out wow, of that afterward. Wow. Yeah, kind of crazy. Uh, and then uh, my name is uh, my name is Dolomite. Oh, oh. and that's really great. That one's really good. I haven't seen that yet. I I am it's... really gl listen. I like I, I haven't yet. I've been saving it. I haven't watched the Eddie Murphy SNL performance. I mean, he's one of my favorite comedians. And my friends who are comedy writers in Hollywood, I know a couple people that know him, st say he is still the funniest guy alive. That you go over to his house as a professional comedy writer, and you're like, I shouldn't be doing this when yeah. you see him. Do what he does while making breakfast. Uh, so I'm really glad he's got a big film coming yeah. out. I thought he was amazing in Showgirls, um, and I'd love to see him get some some Dream more Girls. current. Dream Girls. Sorry, Dream Girls. Dream Showgirls Girls is a different thing, Adam. <laughs> Um, Showgirls is also a masterpiece, but for not, totally not different intentionally, reasons. though. I don't think. <laughs> um, can we talk about Mandalorian for just a moment? By all a second? means, because the my favorite Western samurai film. Oh, well, I mean, the opening. So I was cold on the Mandalorian at the beginning. Okay, I didn't love the first couple episodes. <clears throat> when we got to the third episode, and they did the Seven Samurai episode, and and like that's the fourth. <laughs> fourth. Okay. Yeah. 
it started to open up for me. I was like, okay, I'm kind of in for this. And then episodes, I was up and down. Like I, the, the sniper episode, I could give or take the prison breakout episode I thought was incoherent in a lot of important ways. We don't need to get into why. Yeah. The last two episodes are astounding. Agreed. The cold open of that last episode with the two scout troopers there with baby Yoda in the pouch I, is the best piece of Star Wars I've seen in a decade, I think. And that, that last episode was directed by Taika, Taika Waititi. Waititi. Yeah. Um, with all of his great comedy. I mean, this. <laughs> it's just, they just, supplied the moment you've been waiting for for the entire Star Wars franchise. Yeah. Of, of They already made a joke during the prison episode where Bill Burr goes, hey, I wasn't a freaking stormtrooper! Yeah. <laughs> Which, as someone pointed out, and I, I can't remember who it was, someone pointed out that the presence of Bill Burr in the show implies that there's some kind of space Boston somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on the outer rim. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, Taika Waititi is the perfect director to direct the first moment where you get to see just how terrible stormtroopers well, are at hitting things. I mean, well, they, was, they were able to punch the puppet pretty well, but mm. but like it was very troops -ian. Do you remember Troops? Oh, yeah, I totally yeah. remember Troops. Yeah, it was very, very much reminded me of Troops in yeah. the fact that they were, like, you don't see stormtroopers talking to other stormtroopers ever anymore. No, and I love them comparing notes about, like, apparently he just killed a guy for disagreeing with him like <laughs> the, the radio chatter around a bad guy that of course would be there like oh, he yeah. just force choked a guy yeah. and I, I think so that's good. an example of why the uh, the main trilogy of trilogies was maybe taken not as well because it had to take itself so seriously and you know star wars is no longer just the one movie it's a whole universe and the meta awareness of the star wars culture and this kind of is able to riff on that I in agree. a way that you can't. I mean, I don't think Disney would allow a I, know, I, an episode nine to. So I think the the difference between Star Wars and Marvel for Disney is that they they make enough stuff with Marvel that they let people do that stuff. Like with if you look at Thor Ragnarok and mm -hmm. Guardians Two, mm -hmm. there's a lot of very self aware humor in there that that they're clearly making a comic book movie and they're aware of it. And I feel like Star Wars doesn't get the freedom to do that because they only do one movie a year. But yeah, but I also think that it's a. I think that it speaks to a deep philosophy about what's important about filmmaking because I think that the. I think it's really clear that the big successes within the MCU uh, are often uh, attributable to the specific visions of each of the directors in those seats, whether it's the Russo brothers or uh, Taika Waititi uh, or or, or um, uh, Favreau. Favreau. Or, yeah. yeah, you you get these totally different viewpoints that are that are quite unique and different from each other. So there are multiple genres of MCU films. So I'm really glad that within the Star Wars universe, I had no idea how much I wanted a 30 minute Star Wars nugget of plot a plot in a TV show. Like, but man, now all I want is like dozens of seasons of this. It's It's been lovely between that and Watchmen. It's the first time I've had like a, I've had a point <clears throat> in television in probably 10 years. This, me too. All over Christmas, for yeah. the whole, all of December, all I've been doing is very excitedly waiting every week for His Dark Materials, Watchmen, and Mandalorian. I need to go back and watch His Dark, Dark Materials because you are a, a, a chorus of people that have recommended it now. I will tell you, the thing that's great about his Dark Materials is, it's a giant trilogy of books, so of course it has to be a TV show. Trying to do it in a film would be was folly, yeah. even though I am very appreciative of the film that they made. The television show is phenomenal for some terrific performances, but one of the best parts about the books is that Lyra, Lyra has two superpowers in the books, in the plot of His Dark Materials. One of them is that she can read the alethiometer, the truth-telling device, and she can read it intuitively where most, almost everybody else needs hundreds of books in a library to cross-reference everything. She just intuits what it means, and that gives her tremendous strength. But that's almost her secondary superpower. Her primary superpower is that she's an unbelievable negotiator. Hmm. And this shows up repeatedly in the show and she's up against dangerous, weird, scary people and knows precisely, can see precisely how to thread the needle of what they want and how to offer it to them to her own uh, advantage. That's, it's really great. And the actress they cast as Lyra is fantastic. So I can't sing enough praises about the show. I have, I have the finale to watch and then I'm all done. Um. That's a lot of catch up. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, there's been a lot going <laughs> yes, on. And there's a lot going on. Uh, we filmed a bunch of stuff. So already we kicked off the year with the one day build. We're going to have another one uh, next week. And the project that we've been hinting at that I think we're going to be unveiling that in like two weeks time. Or something. Ooh. Um, 
Also, uh, we are going to start um, putting up more videos about tips uh, and tricks I have about stuff that I use in the shop. If there are tools or items or objects or even processes that you've seen on Tested that you're curious about and you'd like me to do a small video explainer, uh, let us know in the comments yeah. because, uh, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. We're shooting a whole bunch of these this cool. uh, over the next few months. Awesome. Will, anything on your, your end? Uh, TechPod. I mean, we're doing TechPod at uh, techpod.content.town. Uh, this week's episode was a Q&A. We talked a little bit about our trip to Valve to see Alex. Mm -hmm. um, and people have still, despite the 40-minute video that we posted, 30-minute video that we posted, have lots of questions about which VR headset you want to play Alex on. Um, and then we answered we answer reader questions once a month. So um, previous episode was uh, ray tracing, I think. So if you're curious about real-time ray tracing. Uh, as used in video games to make things reflective and make lighting behave the way it works in the real world. So cool. Uh, we talk about how that stuff works. It's fascinating. Awesome. Well, thank you all for listening. And uh, I guess we'll see everyone next week. Bye, Absolutely. Everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>